Hello, let's continue on with part two of chapter 14 blood by looking at the life cycle of the red blood cell. Now, little print here, red blood cells circulate for only about 120 days. Remember, they have no nucleus, they can't do any cell division. That all occurred in the, the bone marrow. They're now just floating around, little ships that carry um, oxygen and hemoglobin. They will break down and they will die and then they're consumed by phagocytic cells either in the liver or the spleen. Um, the spleen actually has a section of it that kind of is tight, kind of a tight network they go through, gives them a little squeeze and if they're going to rupture, they will rupture there. So um, if you have a problem with your spleen, you can, um, often it's shown because of improper uh, formation of your red blood cells or too much destroying of your red blood cells. Your liver is also good at um, destroying your red blood cells. This is why if you have a car accident and have to have your spleen removed, your liver will take over. And here's a, here's a fact for you. 2.5 million red blood cells are destroyed every second, um, but you have trillions of them. So it's a good as long as you are working. now. A little can you even see that little word I, I this is weird I'm trying to make the um, diagram smaller and all it does is change the font Ooh, now we've got the font huge um, oops okay so let's go back to the font here what I was looking at right here good urethropoiesis poiesis poiesis just means um, producing new Urethro is red, and you'll all, we'll see leukopoiesis and a lot of other poiesis. Whenever you see poiesis, that is creating. Okay, urethropoiesis is maintaining your um, urethrocytes through a feedback loop. Good old feedback loop. So let's. Can I make that go away? Just a second. I'm having a moment. Okay. I want, no, I can't make that go away. Okay, now I've got that small, but I've got that too big. Anyway, what we're going to look at is the feedback loop. See if I can fit it all on one page. If not, we will, um, yeah, good enough. Okay, please realize the feedback loop is detected by the amount of oxygen. And when we talk about feedback, you have a receptor, a control center, and then the effector. So the receptor, what, what detects it? Okay. The kidney detects it. So there will be a damage of red blood cells. They're removed by circulation. And as a result, your oxygen level falls. The kidney will detect the declining, declining levels of oxygen and respond by secreting a hormone called urethropoietin. So notice you got that poi in it and urethro means red. So urethropoietin, again, big word, needs an abbreviation, EPO. Urethropoietin will then be released from the kidney. So that is your control center. And then it will cause a response or a stimulus of the red bone marrow. And then the red bone marrow will then stimulate the production of more blood cells. Okay, then you have the immature ones that go into circulation. After two or three days, they become mature urethrocytes, only two or three days. Pretty impressive, huh? And then the number of red blood cells will increase, your oxygen level rise, um, and because your oxygen level is good, it will stop triggering the kidney to produce, to release urethropoietin. Now, Lance Armstrong and blood doping. Lance Armstrong was my hero until I found out that he was a great big fat cheater. Um, part of the reason was is because he did a lot for cancer and my sister had cancer at the time. He also had cancer. She's fine now. She's alive. She had thyroid cancer. She's still good. Um, just a little sensitive. Anyway, thanks for asking. Um, what blood doping is, is since urethropoietin is a natural factor in your body, you can't really detect it or they couldn't detect it. So what they would do is they would overstimulate their body with urethropoietin, produce extra blood cells, and then take out that 
blood. So they would basically give themselves a donation and uh, uh, take a, yeah, donate it to, um, remove their blood and store it. And then the day before they would inject that back in and then they have a high concentration of red blood cells. Good because you conduct, can conduct more oxygen, bad because you increase the viscosity of your blood. So that can cause blood clotting and um, clumping of your blood. Okay. That is what blood doping is. Very hard to catch because um, urethropoietin is natural and it's your own blood going into your own body. However, if they catch you with a lot of blood bags and injection apparatus, I guess that that's um your you're guilty there. Anyway, very interesting. Um, so that's what blood doping is, giving yourself your own blood and in order to have more red blood cells. Another example of your body producing red blood cells or you need to produce more red blood cells is if you are a climbing, a climber, especially if you're going to a place like Mount Everest. In um, when you're climbing, you usually spend two or three days at base camp and then you descend a little higher, spend two or three days there and descend a little higher. So those days where you're sort of going up gives your body a chance to produce more red blood cells. So this way you can conduct oxygen better. Otherwise, your body um, detects that you have it actually really confuses it because you have low amounts of oxygen, but you have a regular amount of carbon dioxide and your carbon dioxide um, regulates your breathing rate. Your oxygen levels will regulate your amount of red blood cells. So it um, confuses the body and you end up with lung problems. Okay. So urethropoietin will, uh, first off, low oxygen detector, Control center kidney produces urethropoietin. Urethropoietin stimulates the red bone marrow to make more cells. So that is a beautiful feedback loop and one you probably weren't aware of, but unless of course you follow blood doping. Okay. Good. Now that is the formation of red blood cells. Now, did you know your poop is brown because of the breakdown of red blood cells? As your body breaks down, it actually recycles it because the iron is very important. So the, these are the mac, the macrophages will come and ingest the old blood cell, blood cells. This is the liver, um, on this side on the, yeah, this is, let's turn on my pen. So this is the liver. And this, in case you didn't realize, is the spleen. Okay. So the liver will break down these blood cells. Then this process, the hemoglobin will be taken out and pretty much recycled if it's useful. The heme will be broken down into the iron and to something called bilirubin. And then the bilirubin, uh, oh, right. I have to shut this off before I can. No, you do it this way. I can't move it. There we go. And then we move down. Good. Um, the bilirubin. So the iron is recycled. It goes back to the bone marrow to create new hemoglobin. But the bilirubin is excreted in your intestines. First off as, pi as bile. And um, if this is why if you're, and it's a very yellowy thing, um, and it, it will produce, yeah, your bile helps produce your poop or helps color your poop, sorry. So if your pancreas isn't, or your liver isn't working right, your poop is clay colored because it's not putting this um, bilirubin into your body. Um, so that's how the iron is recycled. Now you look at the globulins, the globulins are broken down into amino acids and they're recycled too. So everything gets recycled except some of the bilirubin gets excreted in your intestines as a form of bile. You'll soon remember uh, when we talk about the digestive system, the bile breaks down fat into fat droplets um, and then you, you poop it out. So if you have problems with your liver um, and your liver makes bile, then you have problems with the color of your poop. There we go. Bile in intestines, the feces, sorry, bile in the intestines give feces its brown color. Another pigment resulting from the breakdown of hemoglobin gives you, gives urine your yellow color. And if your liver is not breaking things down properly, you get jaundice, which is yellow because of this uh, breakdown of 
the liver. Okay. Good. There we go. Jaundice is a combination of a liver disease. Here we have hemolysis, hemo blood lysis breakdown. Good. Um, there's some other conditions here which just talk about too much um, of something. A little bit here, a disease is anemia. Just know that anemia is a change in white in your red blood cell count and can be a bunch of different reasons. Okay, next. Okay, let's move this. Now I've got the print so big it moves too quickly. White blood cells or leukocytes are the fewest of the form, formed elements. A microliter contains near between 5,000 and 10,000 white blood cells, but a million, five million red blood cells. Okay. Regardless, red, white blood cells are important to your life. So here we got their function. They are disease against invaders and infectious pathogens. There are five types, all of different size, appearance, and function. All leukocytes contain a nucleus. And they also contain a number of other structures, which looks like granules when stained. The presence or absence of the granules is what classifies them. And realize it's just the presence or absence of them appearing. Um, there are granules and egg granule sites. They just don't appear. So let's look at our, our chart. Oh, got to shut that off and then move. Okay. Let's look at our chart. So when we look at the type of granule sites, first off, let's go to our chart and summarize our white blood cells. So their leukocytes, the function is disease defense and also um, prevention, pro protection, protection from pathogens. Now realize a pathogen is any word for an organism that will cause disease, but also parasites. Okay, good. Um, so white blood cells, they have a nucleus. Yes, they may have granule sites. Granules, okay. And depending on the shape of the nucleus will depend on their white blood cells. So let's just look a bit at the white blood cells just because I find it very interesting. Let me save that. Let me move that over. Can we make that smaller? I don't like how big it is. There we go. That's a little better. So when we look at a granule sites, if you remember a granule sites are formed um, in their own, their own little pathway. Um, and granule sites are formed in a different pathway. So they're all based on how they get stained when looking at them. Granule sites have a single multilobular nucleus. So if you look at this one's got a bunch of bumps, this one's got have a horseshoe, um, and this one's a fatter horseshoe. So neutrophils, let's summarize. Neutrophils are the most abundant. Um, they are highly mobile. So these are the ones that will move outside the blood vessel into the space and these ones engulf and digest foreign material. So they are a type of phagocyte because they will, if there's any sort of inflammation or infection, your blood vessels get leaky, the neutrophils move out, and these are the ones that engulf and digest. Now, as they engulf and digest, they will be left over dead, and this is when you get pus. A little bit of pus is okay. That shows that your white blood cells are fighting a disease. Too much pus or green pus means you've got a bacterial infection in your pus and brown pus means you've got blood in it. Too much pus isn't good. A little bit of pus just helps move things out. So if you think of like a little sliver, how if you get a little splinter in your finger, you get a little pus, it helps put things out. 
Those are neutrophils. The neutrophils are the most abundant and they are the ones that migrate and engulf and eat. And this is any foreign material. Okay, so they're, they're not very picky. Anything foreign, they'll get it. Eucinophils. Eucinophils are two to five percent and these are the most numerous in the respiratory and digestive tract and they are allergic reaction and parasite. So they're in your digestive tract because most parasites are eaten and then they're in your respiratory tract because that's where allergens from the air will attract. Okay. Third one, basophils, they are stained in a basic solution. Very, not as popular. Basophils are anticoagulants, which prevents clotting. They secrete histamine, which then causes the vessels to leak. So the basophils will um, prevent clotting. They also cause leaky blood vessels, which will then allow the neutrophils out. Okay, very fascinating. And the neutrophils are the most common. So neutrophils, um, foreign particles, eosinophils, allergies and parasites, basophils, um, infections, they prevent clotting and they prevent, they cause blood vessels to be leaky. And I don't remember the word for leaky right now. It's got dia something in it. It'll come to me later. Okay. Good. They can circulate for five to eight hours, migrate in the tissues, and then they can live for five, four to five days. So they, only, they, they don't live very long. Okay. White blood cells. Very important though, because if you don't have white blood cells, you have, um, you can't fight disease. Now notice if you have a high white blood cell count, especially neutrophils, that means you have some sort of infection. If you have a high eosinophils, then you've got either parasites or an allergic reaction. So not only does a high white blood cell count matter, but the type of white cells matter. Okay. Let's look at the agranule sites. The agranule sites are the lymphocytes, which help to, they're in the lymph to help attack. So this is specific. And then you've got your monocytes and your monocytes are, um, they're slower to the infection, but they're larger at engulfing. So your neutrophils get there fast to fight disease, but they die quickly. Your monocytes will come along later. They're slower, but they can eat more and they become um, what are called macrophages. Okay. And macrophages or phages or phages can stay for years. So let's look at it. Leukocytes are in, or lymphocytes are in the lymph. And they're involved with immunity. So these are your T cells and your B cells. And we'll talk more about T cells and B cells when we talk about um, the immunity. Your, your T cells go to your thymus. So that's, and they have an, what's called an education. They're not really sure what happens in your thymus, but that's where the T cells get their education to become um, T cells. Okay. So they begin in the bone marrow, but they migrate to the thymus to finish their developing. After ma maturing, the lymphocytes go into the lymph. So this is your spleen and your lymph nodes. And now they'll circulate um, between your blood cells and your lymph, and they're just ready there to fight any specific disease. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's for long-term immunity. So they're there to fight diseases that you've seen before. Then you've got your monocytes. Your monocytes are basically your phagocytic cells. They engulf bacteria and viral infections and they will circulate for hours. They can migrate. Then they transform to macrophages and macrophages aggressively ingest bacteria. These are the ones that clean up cellular debris and also in a nice healthy cell or a healthy body, they clean up the, the miscellaneous cancerous tissue that shows up. Okay. I wanted you to be aware of the white blood cells because they're quite fascinating, but 
basically you just need to know the name of them and what they specifically do but to me they're fascinating how how each one of them has their specific target to seek out and destroy very fascinating okay so that's the white blood cells talks a little about leukemia leuco so here we have when anytime you see leukemia it's a white blood cell disease so anything um leuco um there's different types of leukemia but they all have to do with the white blood cell our third cell type is called platelet or a thrombocyte they're the second most abundant formed cell so there's more of them than there are of white blood cells but they're very very small the platelets main role is to stop breathing sorry stop bleeding so hemo for blood and stasis for the same so you want to keep your blood the same very important because if you lose too much blood you will change your blood volume it messes with your pressure it messes with your um, conduction of nutrients and well a lot of things so what I want you to realize is instead of the cells dividing they're actually fragments of larger bone cells so this is why they're called elements and not true cells um, because they break off and they form these fragments which live for only about five or seven days it's showed here with a red blood cell just for size and if you do a lot of um, looking at cells quite often it's compared with a red blood cell because red blood cells are usually the same size so it's kind of like a standard marker okay let's look at blood clotting a very complicated process um, first off let's summarize our table so thrombocytes are found in the buffy coat they're very small and second most abundant okay and these involved in clotting okay good let me find your my clotting video for you because um it's a process and a plot across a process for me is always best if shown in a video there's an an, an animation here and it's also actually very complicated but let's simplify it for you hi let's continue on with coagulation now I'm showing you this video mainly because I want you to realize coagulation is very complicated and there's about 12 different clotting factors one of which if you don't have you have hemophilia the bleeding disease so you have these very complicated clotting factors you also it can also be triggered intrinsically or extrinsically so one is by cutting and the other is by pressure won't go into too much detail other than to for you to realize it is a complicated process but um, and I also want to show you how the factors change and cleave so it sounds like you're making brand new things but you're just changing it so watch this to get the general gist of it and then I will summarize it at the end at the site of vessel injury at the site the of vessel injury to start the sealing the wound simultaneously the coagulation cascade with its various coagulation factors is activated this involves two pathways the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway okay let's summarize for a bit here what's going on so because there's the exposure of these collagen fibers underneath the vessel it will activate the platelets and then the platelets become sticky and when the platelets become sticky they will come and stick to each other so that will form a very quick platelet plug which will plug but it's very weak so it's fast but weak then there's also um, as the platelet plug is is being stuck together it's also activating the coagulation cascade Extrinsic activation begins with now exposed molecules of the vessel wall, such as tissue factor, which forms a complex with factor 7. Finally leading to the activation of factor 10. 
This factor 10A is the point at which the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of the coagulation cascade meet. Okay, well, I wanted to show you this just to, for you to get an idea how one thing will activate another and change the form of it. Don't worry about the 12 steps involved here. The intrinsic pathway consists of various coagulation factors activating each other in a chain reaction at its edge. A complex with an additional cofactor is formed. This complex now activates factor 10. Since the two pathways merge at the level of factor 10A, this factor has a pivotal role in the coagulation cascade. Further down the cascade, factor 10A in combination with 5A activates thrombin and induces the so-called thrombin burst. Okay, so in our textbook, that's called the prothrombin activator, and this is where we start it in our textbook. One molecule of factor 10A can catalyze the formation of a thousand molecules of thrombin. These large amounts of thrombin cause the further activation of platelets and the enhanced formation of fibrin. Fibrin then forms strands, making up the mesh that stabilizes the platelet plug in an arterial clot. Okay, let's go back a step. So you have thrombin, which is the little um, actor, the, the thrombin is the purple guy here. Thrombin is then an enzyme which will activate fibrinogen into fibrin and then the fibrin lays down these fibers which then form the clot. Arterial clot and holds together the red blood cells in a venous clot. Okay so then the fibrin acts as the framework and then different cells get caught in it and you now have the clot. I think it's a beautiful mechanism. So here's the process summarized in our textbook. You have the prothrombin activator, which then creates the thrombin, which then turns the, the, the prothrombin, sorry, the prothrombin activator is an enzyme which takes prothrombin and creates it to thrombin. Thrombin is then an enzyme that takes, here it is, fibrinogen, and anytime you see that ogen, it's an inactive form. So that fibrinogen becomes fibrin, and then the fibrin will then lay down the pathwork to form a clot. And then that clot will plug it, and then the, the clot is actually very stable. And then eventually, um, carbon, collagen fibers will go in and hold it together too. Very stable. So you have the platelet plug that does a quick, a quick and easy plug. And then with time, you have a clot form. And then the clot will be there until it breaks down. Um, and at, with time, the clot will dissolve in pretty much the opposite reaction. And you will release plasmin. And plasmin is the enzyme that breaks down the fibrin and puts it back to fibrinogen in the process as fibrinolysis. Okay? So lysis means cutting. So it sounds confusing until you break it down. So you've got plasmin, which is the enzyme, which will, the hormonal enzyme, which dissolves fibrin's meshwork and the clot breaks apart and you have fibrinolysis. So you can actually get, um, Plasmin or something like plasmin, um, it's given during a heart attack. If you get a heart attack early, they will give it and that will help break down the clot. Now, plasmin is a way to break down the clots naturally and you want to prevent your blood from clotting until it is ready to clot. So that in order to have the prevention of it, you need to have nice, smooth blood lining. This is why um, things like plaques and buildup aren't good because it will trigger the platelets to become sticky and then sticky ones will fire off the um, fire off the, the 
cascade. Also, you want to have a good blood flow. This is why it's important um, that you walk if you are, you shouldn't sit for too long, or if you're laying and bedridden, you, that you'll, part of the exercise is to pump your legs, or if you're traveling, you should wear a support hose. So this way you keep your blood moving. So that way the blood doesn't sit in for too long, and then small, um, Lack of blood flow will delete the thrombin. No thrombin there, it'll form, the, sorry, if there's thrombin there, it'll form the clot. And then you can also have anticoagulants. So your basophils will produce an anticoagulant or you can take a drug such as heparin. And heparin is given for a heart attack patient and that purposely prevents the, or inhibits clot formation. Okay, that is the enough of blood. The, we still have to finish blood typing, but I'll do that in a third video.